Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy seminar. I'm very excited to introduce our speaker today, our own Tom Harmio, Professor of Chemical Engineering Photonics here at Stanford and the director of the SunCat Center for Interface Science and Catalysis. Uh, his lab does the cutting edge catalysis work, which uh, I understand is ways to um, convert electricity into chemicals and vice versa. Uh, his lab has done uh, cutting edge scientific work, but also in recent years uh, led to a number of uh, innovative energy startups. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, this is a personal uh, nice event for me because the very first energy seminar I was responsible for September 21st, 2015, the speaker was the same professor, Tom Hermio, who will update us on what he said then. And fortunately for me, he knocked the uh, ball out of the park and it was very um, well received. So I started out with a with a bang. And he also though set a high bar for all subsequent speakers. I don't know how that, uh, how that works out. Now, uh, since then he's done a couple of panels for, for the energy seminar, but not a solo talk. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, uh, as I mentioned, uh, students in his lab have got on to do many innovative startups. And we did have uh, last November, uh, Natasha Cave, a former student in the Armeo lab talk about Opus 12, which is of the five or six um, startups, there may be more by today uh, that Tom's lab has spawned, probably the furthest along and uh, gotten the most uh, money and the most publicity. So with that said, uh, Tom Hermia, who does both uh, excellent science and is here to change the world or produce students who will do so, Tom. Well, thank you very much, John, for such the, the warm introduction, such a kind introduction. And it really is my pleasure to be part of this energy seminar. Um, and uh, and it's just, it's been around for a good amount of time, which is really an indication of being part of this Stanford community that has been caring very much about energy and sustainability and related matters. And it's just really an honor and a privilege to be part of this community and, and uh, to be able to, to speak with you all today. The theme of today is catalyzing a sustainable future. We'll talk about what that means and, and more particularly developing new processes for the chemical and energy sectors, lots of energy in the uh, fuels and chemicals industry. And we'll talk about what the challenges are, what the opportunities are. And I hope there's something for everyone in this talk today. Uh, we'll be talking at, at a high level, kind of framing what some of those challenges are. Uh, we'll talk about some of the techno-economics behind uh, some of the new technologies that might be in the future. We'll talk about some of the, we'll deep dive into some of the, the techie stuff, some of the science and engineering that we're working on to satiate the appetite of, of uh, those of you working in these technical areas as well. So hopefully a little bit for everyone. And I'd like to start really by uh, thanking and acknowledging the tremendous team that I get to work with every single day. Uh, and this is at the SunCat Center for Interface Science and Catalysis. It's a, it's a partnership between Stanford University as well as SLAC National Accelerator Labs. I hold joint appointments on faculty, uh, both on Stanford and at SLAC. And I serve as the director of this fantastic organization, which is just over 10 years old. And the idea is to bring together uh, research personnel uh, from both institutions uh, to really work towards these very challenging problems of understanding interface phenomena uh, for the science-based design of catalysts and to provide solutions for sustainable processes. And so as you can see here, we have a number of Stanford faculty that are involved uh, directly that are really kind of at the, the core of the center, uh, a lot of uh, Slack personnel as well, and many collaborators, just a few listed here coming from the Slack and Stanford community and a few uh, from abroad as well, from outside of our local community. And the goal here is really, again, as we approach challenges and catalysis problems in energy and sustainability, it's really um, one of the fundamental tenets of the center is to bring together theory and experiment. So it's really grounded on a lot of theory that's coming of different flavors and types, but a lot of the, the modeling that's done in the center is really at the atomic and molecular level. And that really feeds into the design of, of real materials and real systems that we synthesize using a broad range of techniques. We characterize them using a, a very wide range of tools as well. Some of those tools are on Stanford campus. And we also have the powers of a national lab that we can bring to bear on these challenges. Uh, things like a synchrotron and a free electron laser to study uh, using, using some really sophisticated tools, some very difficult 
uh, things to, uh, to be able to see things that are very difficult to normally observe. And then of course we test things and understand the efficacy of these different catalysts and these different processes and feed it right back into the theory. And we wrap it all with a cozy blanket of data science and trying to make the most out of the data that we collect. So before I start diving into what the future might be, maybe a moment to reflect on the, the world as we know it. And I wanted to share with you what I view as one of the greatest successes in the history of humankind. And that is really the modern fuels and chemistry, uh, chemicals industry as we know it. Uh, and so you look at these molecules, things like hydrogen, things like ammonia, you know, gasoline and plastics. And we might have different reactions as we just look at these different types of molecules. But let me tell you that these are the molecules that have allowed us to be so successful as human beings to, to, to lead us to the quality of life that many of us have and not everybody. But if you're on this Zoom call, probably, right? So hydrogen, take a look at hydrogen. You don't go to the store and buy any hydrogen, but you sure buy products that have that hydrogen in it. That hydrogen comes almost entirely from fossil fuels and we produce it at a rate of 65, maybe now 70 billion kilograms per year. And I like this unit of billions of kilograms per year because you can just divide by the seven or so billion people on earth. And that gives you about nine kilos per person per year. And that's about 20 pounds So you know, 20 pounds of hydrogen is which if you average across the face of the globe is what each of us accounts for in terms of global hydrogen demand. And uh, those of us, again, who are on the Zoom call are probably using more than our fair share of those 20 pounds because there, there are billions of people who, who use very, very little of that at all. Now, where does that hydrogen go? It goes, it goes into really two major processes, oil refining, as you can see down here, as well as ammonia production. Ammonia is at 180 billion kilograms a year and climbing. And this is a very important molecule. This is the molecule that is the key ingredient in fertilizer. So about half the fixed nitrogen in your body, right now, half the fixed nitrogen in your body touched one of these iron nanoparticles sitting inside of one of these Haber-Bosch facilities, one of a few hundred around the globe, where we take hydrogen that comes from fossil fuels, add it to the nitrogen that we're all breathing right now to ultimately make that ammonia and send it around and put it into agricultural fields. We grow crops, we can either eat the crops directly or uh, eat the animals that eat the crops. So one way or the other, that's how half the fixed nitrogen enters our body. Now that hydrogen also goes into oil refining. It's basically taking crude oil, which is called crude for a reason. And hydrogen is a very key ingredient to upgrading that to be able to make things like jet fuel or, or gasoline or diesel or lubricants, all kinds of different important molecules that we, that we use every single day. And then here's the, the Houston Ship Channel. And these are uh, where there's a lot of chemical plants doing a lot of different important things uh, in terms of large scale chemical and, and fuels manufacturing. Uh, and the plastics industry, of course, is massive and ripe for reinvention as well. 300 billion kilograms a year and climbing. So you just take a look at a few of these examples. And again, these are just a few examples of the many different molecules on earth that we, that we utilize, which is about 70,000 in case you were wondering, 70,000 different molecular products are made across the globe to fit different needs in different markets with different sizes. And it's amazing and astounding how that system works that we take the resources that mother nature gave us and, and scientists and engineers have come together to come up with a scheme to, to process those, grab stuff from the ground or from the air or from wherever, and be able to make products that are needed across the globe and get it to where it needs to be and all at fairly cost effective prices. Now, there are many issues with that system. Having said that, having explained a little bit of what I appreciate about it, of the many challenges there, one of them is that these processes that we're looking at are driven really by fossil fuels and fossil fuels are intrinsically not sustainable. So these are unsustainable processes in the long run. So that's one challenge uh, that we need to address. And another challenge, <clears throat> excuse me, another challenge is equity. And while there are billions of people that get to leverage the processes that we're looking at right now, there are billions that don't. And that's also a, an issue that we need to think about in terms of providing access for all. So that really motivates coming up with some new ways of making the molecules that we need in a more sustainable and accessible manner. And good luck. That is really, really hard to do because we as human beings have done such a good job to develop all the, the tech that we have in place right now. Uh, but there are some forces at play that are pointing in the right direction. And one of them is the dropping price of renewable electricity. I imagine that at this stage, this is not news to anybody on the line right now, uh, but certainly worth uh, being really clear that the last decade has seen just absolutely remarkable drops in the price of renewable electricity, whether you're looking at wind on the left or solar on the right, we're talking about around four cents a kilowatt hour and it continues to drop. 
So a decade, two decades, three decades ago, the thought of using say renewable electricity as a sustainable source of energy to drive some of these chemical transformations might have seen ludicrous. Now that's actually in play. And so the question is, goodness, okay, great. How can we make use of this renewable electricity? If we want to hot swap electricity coming from a conventional source uh, versus say wind or solar to power, say my refrigerator, okay, that seems like a pretty straightforward challenge. It's not as straightforward as I make it sound, but it's, you know, it's something that uses electricity naturally. But what if you want to make chemical products, you want to make fuels, you want to make fertilizers, you want to make molecules, you want to make plastics, you want to make things sustainable, you want to use this renewable electricity, we can't eat the electrons. We have to put that electricity into a process that ultimately makes the ammonia, which is that then what goes in our body and, and provides the fixed nitrogen that we need. So how are you going to use that renewable electricity? This is what's going to allow us to provide grid scale storage of renewable electricity if we can pull that off and actually make products and, and integrate renewables more into our system. Now I've got good news for you. It turns out that there are some already scaled up industrial processes that use electricity reasonably well. I'll give you some examples here of scaled up industrial processes on the left. This is uh, aluminum electro refining. Every time you grab a can of soda, that aluminum was not something that was mined as an aluminum metal from the earth that came in as an ore. It was a metal oxide, a complex oxide. I'm just gonna call it aluminum oxide just to make the chemistry simple here. And we need to turn that into aluminum metal. So how do we do that? It's we put in electricity and we've been doing it for a long time. Here's a plant in Louisiana that was doing this many decades ago. It has since been shut down, but there are other facilities, more modern facilities that have come up. You can see the scale of uh, the humans here in this, in this large warehouse full of these banks of electrolyzer, the grabbing electricity. It came from natural gas in this particular case back in the day. And we make about 60 billion kilograms a year of aluminum from this process, where basically this process is, is designed to electrolyze the aluminum oxide, which means really stripping the oxygen off of the aluminum oxide, sticking it onto carbon, emitting CO2, but you get your uh, aluminum metal here that you can process. So again, about 60 billion kilograms a year. We've already talked about what kind of scale that is, massive. Uh, and that's about 100 gigawatts on average of electricity goes, goes into global aluminum production. 100 gigawatts, just for a frame of reference, a typical nuclear reactor is about one gigawatt. So that's about 100 nuclear reactors powering this type of a process. Other molecules that we might care about uh, is a process called chloralkali or brine electrolysis. Brine is very heavily uh, saturated salt water, very high concentration salt water. So we take that sodium chloride and water and we electrolyze it to make sodium hydroxide base, um, as well as chlorine with a little bit of hydrogen emerges as well. And so again, you don't go to the store typically and buy sodium hydroxide or buy chlorine. My lab buys it. Um, you probably don't. Um, but that these are very important molecules that we use for so many products out there. Uh, next time you touch a bar of soap, you probably uh, base was used in that process. If you pick up a piece of PVC pipe or if you grab a credit card, um, then chlorine was used in that process as well. As again, you can you can see the scales here. Water electrolysis is of course another process out there, definitely industrialized, large scale. Um, I grabbed these photos of, of plants that have been around for many, many decades, really just to show that it's been around for a while, the technology has been around for a while, but still there's massive opportunities to make it better, to really make it cost competitive. And that's what we'll be talking about momentarily. In this case, this is water electrolysis really for the production of hydrogen. So this is coming from Norway. And uh, back in the day, this is how Norway was making their hydrogen, which then fed into the Haber-Bosch plants to make their ammonia. So with fossil fuel, uh, with fossil fuels coming onto the scene in a big and uh, big way and, and, and processes becoming more cost effective there, it became more sensible from a cost standpoint, a fiduciary cost standpoint to go with hydrogen derived from fossil fuels instead to for the Haber-Bosch facilities. Now this type of concept is coming very much back into fashion. So this is just to show you that this is not pie in the sky uh, chemistry or engineering by any stretch. Uh, this has been done, but the question is, can we make processes like these cheap enough to compete with fossil fuel uh, conventional processes, number one? And number two, this is just a few different examples of molecules that we've made and atoms uh, and metals through these types of electrolysis process. Can we make all 70,000 or at least enough of the 70,000 that we can actually meet global sustainability goals? So that's the challenge. And how do we create that paradigm? So, you know, one important equation here is that uh, if, if you make it, you have to be able to at least co uh, compete cost effectively with it. It's just one of the major, one of the many domains that we need to think about in terms of developing new processes. 
And so I show you this very simple equation that the production cost dollars per kilogram is going to be equal to the capital expenditures dollars per kilogram plus the operational expenditures dollars per kilogram. And for a lot of these molecules that we're talking about, a good frame of reference is around 50 cents to a dollar per kilogram, which if you really think about a kilogram of stuff, two pounds of stuff for 50 cents to a dollar, that's, that sounds pretty cheap. And that's where most of these molecules are. Some are, of course, north of that, some are south of that. But that's a good ballpark to give you an idea. So how do we get there? I think we need, we have four key ingredients. We're gonna need some really inexpensive electricity. I showed you we're down about four cents a kilowatt hour. If we can get down to more like one to two cents a kilowatt hour, kilowatt hour that's a, that will open up the aperture for products in a very substantial way. Even at four cents, there's a lot that we can do, no question about it. Uh, but if it gets down to one to two cents, we're even in better shape. We might need some inexpensive energy storage. Uh, I put down here about $10 a kilowatt hour. The idea is that a lot of these chemical processes they're really not designed to be operating kind of eight to four every day. They're designed to be running 24 seven, 365. And so perhaps some energy storage to uh, load balance that, uh, that uh, feed of electricity would be really helpful here. And this is about a factor of 10 X cheaper than what our current state of the art is today in terms of lithium ion batteries. So a long way to go, but this would certainly help in any of these processes. Uh, if you're looking to make a carbon-based product, then uh, you, you need a feedstock for carbon that is sustainable. And so wouldn't it be lovely if we could get it from uh, CO2. And CO2 we can find in lots of places. You can, there are some point sources of CO2 out there. Of course, it's in the atmosphere. Um, every stream of CO2 out there, every possible uh, stream has its own set of challenges to be able to purify it and put it into a process. But uh, so we need to capture it cheaply. And so if you can get it cheap down to say $30 a ton, Right? These are all aspirational numbers I'm presenting on this slide, but this is, these are the types of numbers that could really flip the switch and, uh, and make these processes much more viable. And then finally, you need the box that you feed all the stuff into and you can actually do the chemical conversions and make the products that you want. So that box, at, let's say if you can get it about down to 20 cents per kilogram CapEx, uh, you know, that feed, you feed in water, you feed in carbon dioxide, you feed in nitrogen, you know, whatever your feedstock molecules are, hopefully it's something nice and abundant. Um, across the globe, uh, then you can just kind of feed this stuff in and do your conversions and get, get out an output price that is somewhere in that 50 cents to a dollar regime, which can make it instantaneously cost competitive. So uh, there are many researchers here at Stanford, Slack, uh, other places that are working in different domains here. What I'll be focusing on today is really these types of chemical processes that do the conversions and very importantly, the catalysts that are the ones that are actually doing the chemical transformations. And so this is kind of our view uh, of what the future could be. It's a subset of possibilities. Um, we're looking at different types of chemical transformations, certainly using renewable electricity to electrocatalyze transformations, using sunlight directly to power transformations. You can either make the, the molecules that you want instantaneously, whether it's fertilizers or, or fuels, et cetera, or you can maybe feed in these molecules into uh, more conventional temperature and pressure different driven reactions and reactors that can then make the products that you want. So there's, there's a whole opportunity to kind of create a new set of technologies that will make a big difference in terms of energy and sustainability ahead. So there are three types of molecules that I wanna talk about today, hydrogen, carbon-based products, and we'll wrap it up with ammonia. So let's start with hydrogen first. And we're going to get our hydrogen from water. And so let me start with some techno-economics. There's a techno-economic analysis done by a company called Proton Onsite. They're located in Connecticut. They were uh, recently bought out by Nell, the uh, Norwegian electrolysis company. And uh, that, they're the longstanding player in, in uh, water electrolysis technologies. And what Proton really focuses on in their, as part of their startup, uh, part of their technology, is focusing on PEM water electrolysis or proton exchange membrane water electrolysis. It's based on an acid membrane, Nafion as opposed to the conventional water electrolyzers these days that are alkaline. And so this is Proton's techno-economics saying, hey, if we can meet all of our, our goals in, in uh, developing this technology, this is what a, a chemical facility looks like, a chemical plant looks like that makes hydrogen looks very different than that steam methane reforming plant that I showed you a few slides back, which is the conventional technology. In this case, you're feeding in water, feeding in electricity, and these electrolyzers, these banks of gray boxes you see here are what are splitting that water into hydrogen and oxygen. But of course, you need more than the reactor. Uh, chemical engineering 101, you know, plant design 101 says you start by designing the reactor, and then you got to build out the balance of plant. You need water management, you need power management, you need hydrogen management, you need all kinds of safety and controls, et cetera, et cetera. And they cost it out. They came out with a, if you're making, say, 50 tons a day of hydrogen, 
it would cost about 50 to 60 cents per kilogram H2 if they kind of met all the goals that they're aiming for in terms of, of their uh, technology roadmap. Now, this looks pretty good. Uh, it's, it's, you know, this is the capital cost. Uh, this does not account for the electricity cost. And just to give you an idea of why it's so important to have one or two cents a kilowatt hour of electricity, one kilogram of hydrogen requires about 40 kilowatt hours of electricity. So if you're paying one cent, that's 40 cents of electricity. If you pay two cents a kilowatt hour, that's 80 cents of electricity. And the current market price of hydrogen is somewhere between one, $1 and $1.50. So if you want to keep this price less than, say, $1.50, you'd better be paying less than two cents a kilowatt hour in electricity to be able to get there. Okay, so that's just one example. Now, the other lever is CapEx. You want to lower that CapEx. And as I pointed out on a previous slide, the, the cheaper the technology is, the better chance you have to be able to compete. And so if we look at the pie chart of where the costs are coming from, of course, the costs are coming from lots of different places, but the biggest slice of the pie is coming from the stacks themselves. Again, these are the gray boxes that are doing the work. And a big chunk of that 54% is the fact that this technology requires precious metal catalysts, platinum and iridium. So a lot of our research effort in our, in our group is, being aim is aimed at really trying to reduce the precious metal content. So how do you go about thinking on how do you develop a cheaper catalyst, a non-precious metal catalyst and then how do you go about integrating it into these types of devices? That's what I'm gonna to get at. And so we originally looked at, we got inspiration from biology. So here's nitrogenase and hydrogenase. These are two biomolecules been around for a long, long time. And they have been engineered through evolutionary processes to do a lot of really interesting things, including make hydrogen. And so understanding how these work has been a major undertaking of the scientific community. I'm sharing with you some density functional theory calculations, some atomistic modeling of the active sites of these different enzymes. This was done by Beard Hinneman and Jens Norsko some years ago. And they basically showed how the active sites of these biomolecules work. Now, biomolecules are great. Enzymes are phenomenal. How do you integrate enzymes into a large scale industrial process? That remains a challenge. And many are doing fantastic work in those domains. In our group, what we've been saying is, okay, or one approach we've taken is like, okay, we can we collaborate with a lot of folks who work on the bio side. That's for sure. I won't be talking about that element right now. Uh, what I will talk about is try to take some learnings from the biology side and, and develop catalyst materials that are more integration friendly with technologies as we know them. So long story short, we found that the edge sites of molybdenum sulfide, a material that you can find at the hardware store. It's a really good lubricant, in fact, uh, kind of works like graphite, has the edges of molybdenum sulfide are very, very similar, have a, a similar motif, I would say, to some of the motifs that we see in these biological enzymes. And so when I was a postdoc back in the day, uh, working in the Technical University of Denmark, we had done some studies of molybdenum sulfide and showed that in fact, it is the edge site that's doing all the work. And then when I started here at Stanford, some of our early stage researchers, uh, Jabot and Jakob, among others, started making all kinds of different uh, varieties of these molybdenum sulfides. And what we found, you know, whether they were nanowires or they were nanoporous materials or these really small molecular cr clusters, what we found is that the more edge sites we could build in, the more active the catalyst. And I'm going to show you here some current voltage data where you're looking at voltage on the x-axis, current on the y-axis. And when you see a negative current, that means that the molecule, or sorry, these materials are making hydrogen. And so if we go to motif one to two to three, we see that this curve marches closer and closer to zero. And the closer it marches to zero means uh, on this scale, the better the catalyst is. This, if it operates at zero, that basically says that, that it's operating right at the thermodynamic limit of how good any catalyst can possibly be. So this is all good news. It's also working in acid. And that's important because in the technology like the PEM electrolyzers I was talking about, those have a nafion membrane, which is very acidic. So what was next? So we did all these fundamental studies. Now let's, start, let's try to do some translation. So here's Desmond. And Desmond was another PhD student in the group. And Desmond said, okay, well, I wanna start building my own homemade electrolyzers. So here's a membrane electrode assembly, a piece of nafion sandwich with some carbon cloth. And that carbon cloth contains some of the catalysts that he had reformulated to be uh, fabricated in a way that was friendly towards this type of device design, which is exactly uh, the types of system that you find in industry. Now, it's a very modest uh, cell. It's only about five square centimeters. But the idea is, can we prove the concept that we can get this thing to work under more industrially relevant conditions? And so here's the, again, a different type of voltage current curve. This is one amp per square centimeter. If you think about it, you know, one amp per square centimeter, you're pushing an amp of electrons through that 
to uh, to make your hydrogen. That's a, what I call a commercial uh, a commercial level reaction rate. And sure, the membrane electrode assemblies that Desmond and made that contain the iridium platinum, which is again that's the de facto what industry uses in this in this context. If he swaps out the platinum with these non-precious metal catalysts, molybdenum sulfides of different kinds, molybdenum phosphides, molybdenum phosphosulfides. He shows that they could actually work under this type of condition. So this is a very important step in the direction of getting these things to a commercial scale. What's better than that is actually putting them into a real commercial electrolyzer. And that's what some of our, our more recent efforts have been targeting. Uh, here's Mackenzie Hubert, who is a fifth year PhD student graduating in the next couple of months. Um, Laurie King, a former postdoc, now a faculty member in the UK. And so they started scaling up all kinds of different catalysts, uh, non-precious metal catalysts from our laboratory. Um, a lot of these ionic materials of metal phosphides, sulfides, nitrides, phosphosulfides, you name it, and scaling them up and sending them over to Connecticut where uh, Proton Onsite could then integrate them into their real deal commercial grade electrolyzer. So uh, Proton actually sells these electrolyzers. They sell them with platinum and iridium. You can see the operating conditions here, 400 PSI output pressure of the hydrogen, 50 degrees C and operating at that 1.8 amps per, per square centimeter. And what you see from the, these polarization curves is that for the cell potential you need for the cobalt phosphide uh, membrane electrode assembly, it requires about 0.2 volts extra than the platinum. So you, you take a hit in energy efficiency, but the idea is that now you've got effectively a free catalyst making your hydrogen as opposed to the platinum, which is of course a very expensive and scarce precious metal. So that was not too surprising because no human being on earth that I'm aware of has made a catalyst as good as platinum without using precious metals. But a big question was stability. How would this thing uh, hold up over the test of time? And so our collaborators over at Proton Onsite let this thing run for a little over 1700 continuous hours. I should say, well, it had some interruptions here and there that, uh, that were not exactly um, designed, but it was interesting to see how they responded. The cobalt phosphide was able to keep on ticking. And that's an important parameter for us to pay attention to if we want to integrate renewable electricity into uh, these types of electrolyzers. And so what they showed is that in fact, this thing was very stable over long periods of time. And by the way, it did not catastrophically fail at the end. It was just the end of the uh, Department of Defense funding on the project. And so they flipped the switch and, uh, and we all moved on. So uh, the good news though, is that the, these uh, catalysts were performing well. They were uh, very active, very stable and really setting a, a path towards uh, larger scale industrialization. Now I wanna switch gears a little bit and say, okay, great. Let's say you have a, a, a photovoltaic uh, that works well and an electrolyzer that works well. How do they work if you pair them together? So that was another project that we've been working on really trying to say, okay, can you just plug in some electrolyzers into PVs? Like what kind of efficiency can we expect out of that? And so we worked together with Professor Jim Harris in electrical engineering to really answer that question. And so he had a student, Ji Young, and two students from my group, Jesse and Lindsay, were working together on this. We're taking a very high efficiency photovoltaic. This was fabricated by Solar Junction, which is a company that was founded by uh, some of the former Harris group members. And it, had, it was a 39% PV efficiency, which means it's very, very high end. It's a triple junction photovoltaic and quite remarkable. If you can think about a device that all you have to do is put it in the sun and 39% of that energy is converted into usable electricity. And so what Lindsay and Jesse and Jiang had done is they constructed some electrolyzers and hooked them up to these photovoltaics. We made these electrolyzers as good as we could and spared no expense using precious metal catalysts as we needed. And we were able to get an average solar to hydrogen efficiency of about 30% over the course of a 48 hour experiment. So that just to give you an idea of, uh, while this 30% is not as high as the 39%, you have to remember that now you actually have hydrogen, which is a molecule that you could store for years if you wanted to. Um, and uh, it is, is a pathway to large scale, uh, grid, uh, large scale grid scale energy storage because that hydrogen is used already in so many different industrial processes. So you can think of it as, an, as, as a sustainably produced hydrogen um, that is, uh, uh, is handling some of the, the energy storage needs as well of our technologies. Um, what's another thing that you can do is you can do what's called unassisted photoelectrochemical water splitting. So now we can take some of the catalysts that we've made and you could surely make electrolyzers and plug the electrolyzers into the photovoltaics, or you can imagine layering those catalysts directly onto the semiconductors and dunking them in the acid and have them split water off the bat. And the good news is if you do that, it's, you can think of it as a, uh, a slightly more expensive kind of contraption than a photovoltaic, but perhaps cheaper than a photovoltaic plus an electrolyzer. Jury's still out on that question, 
but it is a pathway that is uh, the worthy of pursuit, I would say. The challenge, of course, now you're dunking this whole thing, this very fancy semiconductor, into a, a strong acid medium that could, pr in principle, tear it apart. Now, our collaborators at NREL, at the National Renewable Energy Lab in Golden, Colorado, James and Todd, they've been working in this space for some time, and they showed, if you use precious metal catalysts, that they could achieve 16.2% solar to hydrogen efficiency. However, uh, these catalysts did not protect the semiconductors very well underneath it. It, it. it failed catastrophically after only one or two hours. So we worked collaboratively collaboratively with them, a former uh, and recent PhD graduate, uh, Ruben Brito, Mika Benaim, who is uh, en route to graduate in the coming weeks. Uh, he, they worked together and really to develop molybdenum sulfide coatings for this type of system and show that they could get uh, almost a factor of 10x improvement in terms of durability compared to the platinum ruthenium case. But uh, 10x uh, is good from a comparative point of view, but at the end of the day, failing after, I don't know, 12 hours or so is just not going to cut it. And so there's a lot of work to be done here. And we put and we constructed this plot to really kind of show where the challenges are. And we're showing on the x-axis, the highest solar to hydrogen efficiencies for these types of devices um, and the lifetime hydrogen produced, how many milliliters produced of hydrogen per square centimeter. And this is where we want to be. This is the DOE goal that says that if you're making, you want to make 25% solar to hydrogen over the course of about 10 years with a capacity factor of about 20%. And this is where you want to be, and you can see that we've made a number of systems, we meaning the community have made some systems that are knocking on the door of 20%. So we're kind of getting there, getting, we're on, on the path to 25. It's not easy, but we're on the path. But here's a two order of magnitude stability gap in terms of the amount of hydrogen produced. So I think that stability and durability are major, major issues that need to be addressed. So how are we addressing them? One of the questions that we're asking is how do these things operate under real world conditions? So uh, here's Mika and our collaborator Chase at NREL. And Mika went over uh, to Golden, Colorado to work together with Chase and the others to really establish um, a real world testing system, a testing apparatus that we're putting it in, in under the golden sun, uh, Golden, Colorado, quite literally. And this thing is tracking the sun all the meanwhile and making hydrogen. And we can actually see how is this thing performing under true real world conditions? What can we learn from that? And, uh, and hopefully make more durable systems. And so uh, without getting too much into all this data, we're, we're measuring the current voltage profiles. We're measuring the hydrogen gas that's coming out of these systems. Um, we're tracking um, the stability as a course of time. We're also tracking how the daylight is changing. It's different, obviously, morning, noon, and night. Uh, it's different during the course of the day when clouds come in. And so even though this is obviously in January in Colorado, it's not exactly a very sunny set of conditions. This device worked quite well. It, it uh, showed 12.8% solar to hydrogen efficiency and was able to make about 14 milliliters of hydrogen in one day under a true real world condition. So this is just one example of many experiments that we've been working on together with NREL to really address this durability challenge. All right, so I have a few words to say about carbon dioxide and then we'll switch to ammonia and then uh, I'd be happy to take some questions. So these segments will be shorter than the hydrogen. Really, I wanted to focus on hydrogen first. It's the simplest of these reactions and uh, one can start extending some of those concepts to really carbon-based chemistries and, and nitrogen-based chemistries. So carbon dioxide is actually one of the challenges here is selectivity. When you're taking water and you're splitting it, chances are you're making hydrogen and oxygen, not a whole lot of other products you could possibly be making. But if you throw carbon dioxide into the mix, you can make a lot of different molecules. Uh, you can make, for some catalysts would care less that CO2 is even in, in the vicinity and they'll just make their hydrogen anyway. Uh, or you can take the carbon dioxide and make things like formate or carbon monoxide or formaldehyde or methanol or methane. Or you can do some CC coupling and start linking up carbons together and you can make uh, CC coupled hydrocarbons or CC coupled oxygenated molecules. So many different possibilities and really steering selectivity is one of the fundamental challenges here. So I thank the wonderful team of researchers I had a chance to work with uh, and I continue to have a chance to work with over the years. Um, earlier, John mentioned Itasha, there she is. Um, she was certainly one of the uh, early stage researchers and together with Kendra and David were really kind of the first three and Toru came along shortly thereafter, Jeremy shortly thereafter, in really, uh, in really advancing the technologies here. Now, <clears throat> before I talk about some of the science there, let's look at the techno-economics. Uh, we did some techno-economic modeling just to see like, could electrochemical technologies impact the fuels and chemicals industry with respect to, to carbon dioxide? I'd already shown some examples in the case of hydrogen that that looked promising if you meet technological objectives, but what about the case of CO2? 
And so there are a lot of assumptions that go into these types of models, but the long and the short of it is, yes, it can be cost effective. And of the many, many different levers here, certainly the cost of electricity is an important one and the energy conversion efficiency of the device is another. And so whether your product that you're after is carbon monoxide or it's ethylene or it's ethanol or it's methanol or it's jet fuel, whatever it may be, basically they all have their own sets of maps. Um, all of them have you know, some sliver of hope where you could potentially end up in a profitable region if you can make catalysts and technologies that have the right performance characteristics. Now, when Kendra, Tosh and David started working on this, we took a very simple system. It was a, what I call a vanilla copper foil. This uh, you know, is it's just something we bought high purity foil, we polished it up, cleaned it up, and we stuck it into something that was kind of like a glorified uh, Perrier. Uh, it was just you know, sparkling water effectively uh, with a little bit more salts added. And it's you know, carbonated water. And we said, okay, let's give this thing some voltage and see what happens. And there's a lot to be said about all this, but I'll make the, the story short. And that is that we saw 16 different products of reaction, which is really quite remarkable, especially when you're doing this at just these mild conditions of you know, room temperature and room pressure, you're just giving the thing some voltage. And so you can see all these different types of molecules that are just, so many of these are very important for our global economy. Uh, whether you know it or not, you use a lot of these molecules every single day. And we also track the reaction rates and, and figure it out as a function of voltage, kind of when the chemistries turn on or turn off for certain products. And it's, it's really challenging to understand all of this, frankly. We're still, we're still trying to, to figure this out, no doubt. One thing I'll point out is that the voltages required to get this chemistry to go are far more negative than the ones on the hydrogen. So the energy efficiency is not nearly as good. It requires a lot more voltage to go. And the other thing is that the last thing you want, while it's really great that you're making all these great products, that unfortunately, a lot of these products are emerging at the same time. And if you have to deal with separation processes uh, so you can sell your product, you're, you're in bad shape. So you, you really want to come up with selective catalysts. And here's uh, Steph and, and Chris and, and others who really work to understand what are the mechanisms going on. And I'm certainly not going to go through this slide in detail. Um, if it looked confounding to you, let me just say it, it's, uh, that's because the chemistry is confounding. You're starting with CO2 and you're trying to understand pathways to methanol, pathways to methane, you know, pathways to ethylene, pathways to acetaldehyde, pathways to ethylene glycol, pathways to eth It's just, it is a mess and, and the, there's no consensus in the community on how all of this works. So there's many, many unanswered questions. But uh, I want to share with you just a little snippet of some of the things that we've been up to to try to understand some of this. Uh, so here's Lay, who when he had this hypothesis um, where just in, increasing electrode surface area can impact the selectivity and steer the products towards some directions versus others, which is actually quite unconventional, uh, quite counterintuitive. Usually if you have a higher surface area catalyst, you can increase the overall rate of reaction, but how is it going to actually steer the selectivity? So let me just show you what it does. Um, he, he developed these systems, or I should say he leveraged literature reports on these copper nanoflowers that, that we call them. That's what they look like to us. Uh, this had been synthesized decades ago for other technologies. They repurposed it and said, okay, let's go to really high surface area systems. I bet, we, I bet we see something interesting here. And now what he was able to do, you can, you can see here, there's a lot of different nuances to these studies. Happy to entertain them in the Q&A if you'd like. Uh, we're using carbon monoxide instead of carbon dioxide is what we're feeding in. We're doing this in base instead of in neutral conditions, which is closer to the Perrier that I was kind of alluding to before. And the, the long and the short of this is that Lay was able to show that at more modest potentials, not going nearly as negative in voltage, so you get higher energy efficiency, he's able to get almost 100% of the selectivity, not towards those 16 different products, but really to these three you see here, ethanol, acetate, and acetaldehyde, which are all really, really important molecules out there. And so he was able to steer the chemistry towards just a subset of that large mix of different products. And then he took it one step further and he said, well, I want even more selectivity than that. So then he started decorating the surface with a little bit of silver. And I'll show you what happened. So you, if you take a copper foil without the silver, this is what the data would look like in terms of, you know, you give me different voltages, you see a different mix of products that you see here, what I'm going to call some of the usual suspects and he just on this flat foil decorates a little bit of silver and now you can see just by eye this it's the colors are different you see a lot more blue what is that blue it's acetaldehyde it's really got the chemistry to steer towards that one particular carbon-based product 
I won't go into, there's a lot of theory calculations. I mentioned we do a lot of theory and experiment com, uh, combined work in SunCat. Won't dive into to that at the moment, but we do have a good, there's a, a logic and a rhyme behind that uh, reason. And what we see here is that, uh, that if we take that strategy and take it one step further, we have the copper silver foil versus a copper silver in this nano flower geometry, we can improve it even further. We get better energy efficiency because we're operating at less negative voltages. And you can see that this bar that's blue is much, much higher. That's again, the acetaldehyde. So what are we looking at here? Instead of 16 different products that we're making uh, of all kinds of different varieties and flavors that are happening at very negative voltages, we've scaled back the voltages to a much more energy efficient condition. And we're steering the selectivity where about three quarters of the current is going to this one product of acetaldehyde. And if you notice, most of what's not acetaldehyde is actually hydrogen. So if we ac actually account for just the carbon-based chemistry, over 90% of that selectivity is going to that one product of acetaldehyde. So if we go back to this kind of map um, that uh, Stephanie and, and others had put together, you can see that here's this one molecule of acetaldehyde. You know, somehow we've been able to figure out some way of steering the chemistry to go down all the right pathways to end up here, not going further, not stopping sooner. And that's just one example of one molecule, and we have to understand all of them if we really want to develop catalysts and processes that cover it all. So still many challenges remain. I'll wrap up uh, with just a few brief thoughts on ammonia. And ammonia, we've already assessed uh, the importance of that molecule. I want to again thank the wonderful friends and the collaborators that I've had a chance to work with over the years on this. Uh, this is part of a project uh, that we work in very close uh, conjunction with the Technical University of Denmark, uh, where Professor Eve Korkendorf, uh, my former postdoc advisor, in fact, uh, has a center called the, uh, the V Sustain Center, which is funded by the Willem Fonden, which is uh, a, a private foundation in Denmark. And so working together with students and postdocs there, faculty there, and uh, folks over here on this side at Slack and at Stanford, uh, we're really trying to aim to, to make ammonia in a more sustainable way. And you already have heard the motivation. Uh, we have this wonderful Howard Bosch process that works so well, but what it's not so good at is ultimately delivering that ammonia to the crop that needs it. And so in other words, the distribution of ammonia is a major problem because this chemistry only works if you operate at really high pressures and really high temperatures. And it's tough to decentralize that type of a process. You need these, just a few, if you wanna call it centralized facility that make it by the megaton. Uh, and then you, you send it around. By the time it gets deposited and delivered to the agricultural fields, more than 50% of it will end up as an environmental problem as in runoff and water, for instance, less than 50% what came out the plant gate actually ends up in the crop. So that's an inefficiency that we can address to make it more sustainable. And very importantly, we'd like to make it more decentralizable so that people across the globe have more access to ammonia. Uh, the price, by the way, of what uh, you would pay for, for fertilizer in Central Africa is about 5x the price that you would pay in Central United States. So that's just an example of some opportunities. And what we would love is something like this, uh, a contraption where you put some solar cells, you put in some uh, technology that can do the chemical conversions, you feed it electricity. And when the sun is shining and water is present and naturally nitrogen is already present in the atmosphere at 78% or so, uh, then you, this technology could make that ammonia on the fly and feed it right to the crops. And you could do this any place on the globe where you have sun and water and agriculture. Uh, without getting too much into the nitty gritty, there are some major challenges. At the end of the day, what this plot is saying, and I'm not going to go into the details, is that these types of catalysts uh, that could possibly do this chemistry of N2 to ammonia, they would much prefer to make hydrogen instead. And that's not, in this case, the desired product. So how do you get the selectivity towards ammonia instead of hydrogen? And so three of our, our former students in SunCat, uh, Ayush and Josh uh, and Jay, um, got together to work on this together with some others and uh, came up with a process that could work with renewable electricity. So here's the idea. You have renewable electricity. You feed into this contraption. We're doing molten salt electrolysis. And so we feed in some lithium hydroxide. You use that electricity to plate lithium plus to lithium metal. And then that lithium metal, you can feed it into a reactor with nitrogen, a tube furnace, or you know, it doesn't have to be high temperatures or high pressures. You just feed nitrogen to lithium, you'll make a lithium nitride. You dunk that lithium nitride in water, you'll hydrolyze it to make ammonia coming out and lithium hydroxide once again, and you can collect it, cycle it right back through and just keep going back and forth. So this is a way of 
renewable electricity going into a process and ultimately making ammonia where 88% of the electrons end up is ammonia. That's a much higher selectivity uh, than any catalytic process uh, under similar conditions that we're aware of. How much land area would you need if you're a farmer and you're saying, okay, that sounds great. You know, how many solar cells do I need to cover my agricultural field with my, my crops need sunshine too. So we did the calculation. If you have hundred kilograms of ammonia per hectare per year is the standard consumption rate. Uh, and you have this process that's say 88% Faradayic efficiency, you only need about five square meters of solar cells. And uh, that's like to, our, to the best of our PowerPoint ability is the way of representing five square meters of solar cells within one hectare of, of 10,000 square meters. So, uh, so it, it does seem from a number of different metrics, uh, potentially feasible. Uh, so in fact, uh, Josh and a few others from Suncat have, have uh, started one of the companies that John was alluding to earlier, Nitricity it's called, uh, that is aiming to, to do exactly that, scale up processes that involve um, uh, nitrogen to ammonia. So the last technical comment I'll make is right here and then we'll conclude uh, is that for those of you who are interested in ammonia production and studying these chemistries, this is really directed towards the, those who are at the bench uh, trying to make some measurements to know uh, how do you quantify the ammonia that you might be producing. I just wanna encourage you to take a look at these two papers um, that we've been working on or three papers, excuse me, um, regarding uh, protocols and methods for really being able to do the quantitative analysis for ammonia production under these mild conditions. I won't go into the details there, just wanna point out very important to have rigorous protocols on that front. So let me summarize, uh, and really the main overarching theme of the talk is that through catalyst design and process development, there are promising pathways uh, that are emerging for the sustainable production of fuels and chemicals. I showed you a few examples here. There's many other examples that we're working on that others are working on, but hydrogen is a big ticket molecule aiming to make that through water electrolysis and PEC water splitting, photoelectrochemical water splitting, CO2 electrolysis, if you're interested in making carbon-based fuels and chemicals, as well as nitrogen processes to make ammonia. And with that, I just wanna thank the many uh, students, researchers, postdocs, faculty members, staff members, so many wonderful collaborators that we've had a chance to work with on, the, on, the, on what I've shown you today, as well as our, our funding agencies. I thank you all for your attention and I'll leave you with this and happy to take any questions. Thank you all so much. Great, thanks, Tom. That was terrific. A tour de force doing from uh, macro global scale down inside uh, molecules of various sorts. Uh, we, do, we do have uh, maybe 10 minutes for questions uh, before your student session. Uh, I guess the um, first set of questions are around the um, kind of new paradigm cost goals in the four areas you put forward. And you did say uh, those were stretch goals, really aspirational. But you also said uh, we could do a lot, even the current um, current cost and prices. So we're, we're, how far do you have to go and how fast do you think uh, we're going to be able to go in that direction? Yeah, great question. Thank you uh, so much for asking that. Let me see if I can get to the appropriate slide here. Um, give me one moment. There we are. So yeah, the the so I get the, if I understand correctly, the question is how far are we from these numbers? So let's start with renewable electricity. So this is the one where I probably have the most confidence. Well, actually, before I, I dive into some of the details on these quadrants, let me just say this: that already today, there is a market to do what I was just talking about. For, for certain applications. So let's not think of it as either we're there or we're not there. Of course, it's a, it's a roadmap. And it's really just as simple as just, just like uh, dispatch curves for electricity, right? There's different prices and supply and demand dynamics and you know, what people are willing to pay is really dependent on certain situations. And so, uh, and so, so already today, a lot of these technologies are, are in play. And the problem is, is that while they might be sustainable, uh, the, 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 the amount that's produced and the amount of electricity, let's say, or renewables that are going into that is so small, that it's really not making a global difference um, when we're trying to meet sustainability goals at that level. So it's a, it's a roadmap and we got to figure out like with each step, how do we make things cheaper and better so we can access, you know, open that aperture to that piece of the market. The aspirational numbers that I present here are the one where if we can get to this spot, the paradigm is all set to flip, even without, say, you know, subsidies or anything. Is like, why wouldn't we use this technology? And so, so you know, so then we can look at these numbers with that framing and say, well, one cent a kilowatt hour. There, there are some in the electricity sector that feels like we're on that path and we're going to get there almost no matter what. And the only question is, is it five years out, ten years out, twenty years out? 
I'm not an expert in in uh, in those market dynamics, but the fact that we're already down at four cents now, granted the the decreasing in price in the last two three years is a different slope than what it was the the years before that, but this one is probably the one I have the most confidence in nonetheless. Energy storage here, we just don't have a solution right now. Lithium ion is phenomenal. It's awesome. I love it. Let's keep rolling that out. That price will keep going down. I don't know if we're going to be able to get down to say $10 a kilowatt hour using lithium ion as we know it. We just need fundamental new chemistry, new designs, new ideas, and let's rely, let's bet on ourselves, human ingenuity to be able to get there. Uh, carbon capture, uh, this one is going to be, uh, this is a really tough one, especially if you want to get it from air. So I don't know if we'll ever be able to get to this value from air um, without subsidies. I'm very curious about that, but that's you know one of the more ambitious ones I'd have to say of the bunch, but there are other, there are other point sources of CO2. Uh, for instance, biorefineries, the ethanol that we make in the United States, just as an example, uh, for those of you who don't know, about 10% of the gasoline, when you stop in the tank or stop at the Phillips station, put in, 10, uh, put in gasoline, 10% of that is actually ethanol. And that ethanol is coming uh, almost entirely from fermentation. And so the, uh, the US demand on, on gasoline is about 140 billion gallons per year. So that means about 14 billion gallons of ethanol per year. And these biorefineries that are doing fermentation have a really nice stream of CO2 coming out of them that actually ends up in soda is one of the, uh, one of the outlets for it. But uh, you know, thankfully for a health reason, we don't drink as much soda as we uh, consume gasoline, um, or I wish we consumed as little gasoline as we did soda. Bottom line is, is that that's another uh, source of CO2 that we could get at that is, is much uh, easier to capture and process than, than that in the air. So again, different stages you can imagine of technologies. And then this is what we talked about today, where uh, say water electrolyzers, commercial water electrolyzers today are in the ballpark of about a dollar a kilogram capex, just to give you an idea. So uh, to get down to 20 cents, um, sounds easy, but remember that's a very scaled up commercialized technology. So much like the lithium ion example I gave here, we just really need to come up with all kinds of new concepts, ideas, catalysts to make them cheaper. And, and we are on a good path, um, but uh, that's still, I would call that an aggressive target. Great. So it sounds like there could be uh, significant um, improvements in sustainability, even if you only got part of the way to these goals. Is that correct? That's right. So every every step of the way is is um, in the right direction. Um, and the question is, how far can we push this? Because we have 40 gigatons and climbing that we need to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. Then there's a set of questions around. I guess it really has to do with um, what I would call chemical pollution. So uh, there are a few questions on, could you use uh, biofuel feedstocks like excess or old trees was a specific, or dead trees was a specific question. And on the other end of it, uh, there was a couple of questions regarding excess chemicals. Are you still gonna have undesired, even uh, how, how long will it take to engineer things so you don't have residual kind of excess chemicals around even in, uh, as you get into the new paradigm or is that part and parcel for the new paradigm? Yeah, these, these are great questions. On the on the first question, you know, using dead trees, for instance, I mean, that is a resource. It's absolutely a resource. And, and I don't think we're in any position to, uh, to really uh, kind of discount any type of technology. The first question I would ask is what's the possible scale of a technology? And, um, it, you know, is it going to be contributing at the kilowatt level, at the megawatt level, at the gigawatt level, at the terawatt level? And, uh, and I don't think we need to restrict ourselves to only things that are operating at the terawatt level, as lovely as that would be. At the end of the day, it's, it's really a, a sum of technologies that it's gonna get us to where we hope to be. And so let's not discount things. Um, you know, let's, if it has some sensible scale, it might be a great local solution or a regional solution. You know, that could be a very fantastic uh, concept that needs to be developed. So, so that's the first thing I would say. And, you know, and remind, I want to remind everybody that's very different from how we've lived life. We have, re we have relied on fossil fuels. Over 80% of our energy has come from fossil fuels. They're absolutely astounding, remarkable, amazing. It's basically one platform of technology that has provided for all these things that we have today. And now we have to say, well, maybe we need 50 different technologies that, that all work very differently, but have to work in concert to get us to where we want to be in terms of sustainability. That becomes a different type of challenge. Now that Houston Ship Channel that I, I showed you earlier, I worked on the Houston Ship Channel uh, after college, and it was amazing. I worked in a, a monomers facility, you know, producing acrylates by the megaton, 
it was amazing uh, and more but more cool or as cool as working on that particular facility and seeing things work at a large industrial scale to me what really struck me was how interconnected the Houston ship channel is and we're talking about miles and miles and miles of facilities where you know feedstock comes in products come out some of those products go right into the next door facility they get used by some other company perhaps a competitor uh, that, that uses it for its purposes. And that interconnectedness has been woven and that kind of grew um, somewhat organically over the past you know, half century more. And that's why we have such inexpensive gasoline or inexpensive plastics or inexpensive fertilizer. It's like, these things are all really interconnected. So how do, we, how do we develop that level of interconnectedness with all these new technologies that are coming out? We have to think at that level too. We can't just focus on our own little technology that produces its, its molecule and hope that it's drop-in replaceable with what's out there because chances are it's not gonna be able to compete. We need to be designing at least two, three, four steps ahead, kind of know where all the other technologies are going so that we can create an ecosystem where they can all cooperate together. Great. Uh, thanks, John. We're just about out of time, so I think I'll leave my normal. Uh, what advice would you give to the young students coming through about where the most uh, attractive areas are to be wor uh, working uh, nowadays in your neck of the woods, which seems to be a pretty big one and a very important one. So with that, I'd like to thank you for a truly uh, inspirational thing. It may be uh, all the way through, make me uh, maybe um, think that I wish I had paid more attention when I was taking AP chemistry years ago. Uh, but I think things have uh, progressed a long way since then as well, uh, thanks to people like you. So thanks once again, and uh, you're now almost to the time where you've got to join your student follow-up session. So thanks once again for an outstanding seminar yet again. I appreciate that, John. Thank you so very much for inviting me and having me. It's always a pleasure. Great. Thank you.